Hello everybody, this is Dr. Abdel Kader Ashur. Uh, today we are going to continue our series of videos about neuropharmacology. And today is the second part of introduction to neuropharmacology, where we will discuss the action potential, axonal conduction, junctional transmission, and co-transmission. Then we will finish with the presynaptic regulation of neurotransmitter release. We will start with the uh, axonal uh, action potential and axonal conduction. Okay. As we know from the autonomic nervous system physiology that the interior of the cell is negative as compared to the outside of the cell. Okay, so if you look here in the bottom right uh, corner, this is the cathode ray oscilloscope. Okay, it's, it measures the voltage inside the cell as compared to the outside and shows here it's about minus 70 millivolt. Okay, uh, as compared to the exterior. Okay, this is called the resting membrane, transmembrane potential, or simply resting membrane potential. Okay, uh, action potential or uh, nerve, uh, nerve impulse. It's also it's the same thing. Action potential or nerve impulse developed when depolarization reaches a threshold level. Okay, there, when there is a stimulus, okay, there will be some depolarization. Depolarization means that I'm going toward the zero, toward the depolarization point, which is zero, okay? Which is manifested by the influx of the sodium. Okay, why sodium is influxed from outside to the inside, okay? We know that uh, the extracellular level of sodium is high as compared to the inside. So sodium will flow, if, if I open the sodium channels, sodium will flow from outside to the inside. Okay, down its electro, uh, electrochemical gradient. Chemical gradient, because it's high in the outside, low in the inside, so it will move from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Electro, electrical gradient, because we said, you just, you just said that the interior of the cell is negative, and sodium is positive, so it loves it to go inside, okay? That's why they call them sometimes fast, sodium channels okay so sodium channels will open sodium will uh, get into the cell so there will be sodium influx into the cell okay so again there is a rapid initial there is a rapid increase in sodium permeability through the opening of voltage sensitive sodium channels there will be inward movement of uh, sodium and rapid depolarization so again here so sodium 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 so i'm adding positive means that i'm i'm taking out negative so negativity will decrease from minus 70, minus 50, minus 40, minus 10, 0, okay? And then again it will continue, but we'll hear plus 10, 20, and about 30, 35 sodium channels will, uh, 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 will be inactivated, okay? And here there will be opening of potassium channel, okay? Potassium channel will open. What happened to potassium? So now I open the channel. What would happen to the potassium itself? Again, compare the level of potassium inside and outside the cell. Potassium, as we know, is more, much, much more inside of the cell as compared to the outside of the cell. So it will move from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell, okay? So down its, elect uh, down, down its chemical gradient. But the electrical gradient, okay, is opposing that because potassium have its beloved negative charge okay next to it right so it'll, it doesn't like to leave it and also it need to go to positive charge outside so it does not like to but the concentration gradients wins at the end okay so that's why we notice that uh, the movement of sodium is very fast because sodium has both both forces the electrical forces from positive to negative and chemical forces uh, from or chemical gradient from high extracellular level to low intracellular level. Uh, as compared to potassium, potassium has the chemical gradient, yes, from the inside to the outside because the inside is high, the outside is low, so it will go from inside to outside, but it will be opposed a little bit by the electrical gradient which will uh, 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 try to keep potassium inside, but eventually potassium will move outside. Anyway, this kind of explain why they call it sometimes slow potassium channels. Even potassium uh, uh, supplement, they call them sometimes slow K. You know, potassium uh, uh, symbol is K, right? Calium. So, uh, anyway, 
potassium uh, as we said last time will come say oh guys are you still here okay i'm coming outside now so it will come okay outside so opening of potassium channels you say he delayed opening of potassium channels okay then uh, this will lead to outward movement of potassium okay in the direction of their concentration gradient okay and this will lead to repolarization so here depolarization okay and here I'm going toward the polarization again. That's why they call it repolarization. Okay. Then the uh, uh, the transmembrane ionic currents produce localized change in the membrane potential. Okay. This will lead to excitation of adjacent portion of the resting uh, axonal membrane. Okay. So that's why we saw it last time. It's like action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential. This will lead to propagation of action potential without any decrease or any decrement along the axon. Okay, this was for the axonal conduction. Okay, we said for axonal conduction is action potential, action potential along the axon, right? Uh, then at the end of this action potential, okay, at the end of this axon itself, okay, at the ter nerve terminal, there will be uh, the junctional transmission. When action potential reaches the axonal terminals, it sets a series of events that initiate the transmission of excitatory or inhibitory impulse uh, across the synapse or neuroeffector or uh, junction. When I say synapse here, I mean nerve to nerve. Uh, neuroeffector or junction means the post uh, ganglionic neuron uh, with the effector organ itself. Uh, then the, this will be followed by the transmitter release. The transmitter is, uh, usually is stored in synaptic vesicles, okay, in the pre-junctional nerve ending. So, subhanallah. So it's at the end of the nerve terminal where exactly I need the neurotransmitter. It is stored in tens of thousands of molecules in synaptic vesicles, okay, uh, ready to be released into the synapse, okay. Depolarization of the pre-junctional nerve endings, okay, this is kind of continuum from what we said now. So, axonal conduction, okay, action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential, until the nerve ending, here, they will, this, cause, this will cause sodium influx and calcium influx. Calcium itself will promote the fusion of synaptic vesicle with the axoplasmic uh, membrane. So, the nerve terminal itself has its membrane, right? So, the, and then the physical itself has a membrane. So, uh, uh, calcium will facilitate the fusion of these two membranes and the release of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft or the neuroeffector junction. The contents of the vesicles are discharged into the synaptic cleft by a process known as exocytosis. There is endocytosis, bringing something from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell, and there is exocytosis, is opposite, okay? The released transmitter combines with specific receptors on the post-synaptic membrane, okay? This is summarized here, the whole story is here. So here, if you look here, okay, above that figure, okay, if you go up a little bit, okay, this is the axon, okay, axon, axon, so the axon potential, axon potential, axon potential, axon potential, okay, until I hear, okay, here, you see here, there is a, a, a sodium influx, of course, and this will be followed by calcium influx. Okay, calcium influx. Calcium will facilitate the release of the transmitter. Okay, this is the transmitter. Transmitter is stored in vesicles. Okay, this transmitter is stored in uh, uh, synaptic vesicles. Okay, the calcium will uh, facilitate the release of uh, the transmitter from these synaptic vesicles into the synapse or the neuroeffector junction. Okay, so it will facilitate the fusion of this vesicle with the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the nerve terminal membrane. Okay, and then this will lead to exocytosis of the transmitter into the junction here, okay, or the synapse or the ganglia or the neuroeffector junction. Okay, then this uh, transmitter can activate or inhibit certain receptors. Okay, therefore, uh, depending on the nature of the transmitter itself, okay, whether it's excitatory or inhibitory. We will either have excitatory post-synaptic potential, EPSP, or inhibitory post-synaptic potential, IPSP. We'll talk about these in details, okay? EPSP, excitatory post-synaptic potential, means 
increase in permeability to cations, mainly sodium and sometimes calcium. Please remember this. Sodium, calcium are excitatory. This, both of them will go inside, into the inside of the cell, okay? They are positive. They will facilitate the depolarization, okay? So the, 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 the voltage will move from minus 70 to minus 60, minus 50. So it's, it's helping the action potential to develop, right? Okay. Uh, so the result in depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane is called excitatory postsynaptic potential. If the excitatory postsynaptic potential ex uh, exceeds a certain threshold value, it may initiate a propagated action potential in the postsynaptic neuron, contraction in muscle or secretion in a gland, okay, it will lead to a fully blown action potential with the subsequent effect. Okay, IPSP, okay, selective, selective uh, increase in permeability to uh, chloride or potassium, okay, please remember chloride or potassium. Uh, result in stabilization or actual hyperpolarization of the postsynaptic membrane, which constitutes an inhibitory postsynaptic uh, potential. Okay, chloride moves in. Okay, when the chloride channels, chloride moves from outside to the inside because it's more in outside as compared to the inside. Potassium, as you know, more inside as compared to outside, move out. Okay, so if I took, you know, uh, discuss it in details. Okay, when chloride enters. Okay, the resting brain potential was minus 70 millivolt, right? Now it will become minus 80, minus 85, minus 90, right? So go down, down, down. So if I need to, to, to initiate an action potential, I have to spend too much effort to bring this from, instead of minus 70, from minus 80, minus 90, that's why it's inhibitory, okay? So it inhibits the development of action potential, okay? As compared to the excitatory one, when I introduced sodium or calcium, this helped because it, uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, it caused depolarization, okay? So the voltage increased from minus 70 to minus 60, minus 50, so I can easily develop action potential. As compared to this one, uh, chloride inside, okay, I'm giving minus, or potassium outside, I'm taking positive, so again, the minus 70 millivolt will be minus 80, minus 85, minus 90. That's why it's inhibitory. Okay? Please, you know, think about it. You will love it. Okay? So it tries to oppose or regulate the excitatory potential uh, simultaneously initiated by other neuronal sources. After combination with the receptor, the transmitter is either degraded, okay, because it did its function. Now I don't need the transmitter to continue forever. Suppose I'm activating the cardiac muscle, okay? So I'm increasing heart rate, I need to run. So adrenaline, ba adrenaline bound to beta receptors. Now heart rate, instead of 70 beats per minute, became 100, become 110, that's enough, okay? So it should be degraded. Otherwise, it will continue, may I, the patient, maybe the patient have, you know, tachycardia, atrial flutter, God forbids, uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, and then God forbids, ventricular fibrillation. So the body, thank God, that these things does not have, there is a regulatory mechanism. So they, they are transmitted either degraded, like, like acetylcholine by acetylcholine streets, and norepinephrine uh, or noradrenaline by catechol o transferase, catechol o transferase, okay? Or is taken back into the presynaptic terminal by active reuptake or active transport in uh, extra neural, neuronal sites. So steps involved in excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmission, okay? So if there is excitatory uh, input uh, by uh, uh, like glutamate, okay, it has excitatory uh, effect, okay, it will, it will lead to influx of sodium, okay. As we said, sodium will facilitate, it's, it, it will lead to excitatory postsynaptic potential, so the potential will move a little bit, okay, so the voltage, I'm sorry, the voltage it was here minus 70 millivolt, now it may be minus 60, minus uh, 55, whatever, okay. And this could lead to fully blown uh, action potential. Okay, so it so it's easy to move from here to here, right? Uh, as compared to inhibitory input from maybe uh, uh, GABA, uh, gamma amino butyric acid, or glycine. Okay, this leads to chloride influx or potassium influx. Here I'm either introducing negative charge or taking out positive charge. So the the the, the voltage here, okay. 
This is the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So the voltage here, instead of here minus 70, became like minus 85, okay? And uh, so this is difficult to develop subsequent uh, action potential or fully blown action potential. It's very difficult here, so this will lead to inhibition, okay? Okay, then uh, co-transmission. Co-transmission, I, I taught you before, please, you know, the titles kind of speaking to you says, okay, it is saying something. Co mean that there are, in addition to the transmitter, there is another transmitter present in the same uh, nerve terminal, okay? So the classical one neuron one transmitter model is considered as oversimplification. Many peripheral central neurons release more than one active substance on stimulation, okay? So they found that there are so many, more than one transmitter are present in one nerve terminal, okay? In the autonomic nervous system, beside the primary transmitters, of course, the primary transmitters are the, the acetylcholine and the parasympathetic nervous system and in part of the sympathetic nervous system, as we'll explain later, and nor adrenaline or nor epinephrine in the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, in addition to these primary transmitters, okay, the neurons contain uh, uh, co-transmitters, okay, such as purines, ATP, adenosine, okay, uh, uh, peptides such as vasoactive intestinal uh, peptide, uh, VIP, or neuropeptide Y, substance P, and nitrogoxide, okay, all of these are called co-transmitters. Okay. In most uh, cholinergic neurons, VIP, okay, vasoactive intestinal uh, peptide, okay, is associated with acetylcholine. However, uh, ATP is associated with both acetylcholine and noradrenaline. Where it is, okay, usually it is stored in the same neuron, not in different neuron, okay, but uh, it might be in a separate vesicle, separate vesicle, or it might be stored as ATP. Uh, stored in the same vesicle, like ATP is stored with uh, noradrenaline in the same vesicle. Okay, as shown here, okay, easily. So this is the primary uh, transmitter, okay, and this is the co-transmitter in green. Okay, so the primary transmitter, again, as we said before, action potential, action potential, action potential, calcium influx, fusion of the vesicle with the uh, nerve dermal membrane, Okay, and then release of the contents, which is the release of the transmitter into the synapse and uh, uh, the, the neurotransmitter will bind to its own receptors. Okay, to primary transmitter receptor R1, okay. The co-transmitter in green here, okay, again, same thing is in vesicle and then fusion of the vesicle with the nerve terminal membrane, okay, followed by release of the co-transmitter, it can bind also to uh, uh, its own receptors, okay. Okay, what's the rule of this co-transmitter? Okay, it may serve to regulate the presynaptic release of the primary transmitter. Look here. So here, the, the co-transmitter is released. It might bind to presynaptic receptors, okay, to regulate or inhibit the release of the primary transmitter. Okay, second thing, it might regulate the postsynaptic sensitivity to the primary transmitter. So in this second case, we're not talking about the presynaptic regulation, no, we're talking about the postsynaptic sensitivity of the receptors to the primary uh, trans uh, uh, transmitter. Or it might itself work as an alternative transmitter, okay? It might itself work as alternative itself, can lead to uh, a certain uh, action, okay? Or certain function, gland secretion, uh, muscle contraction, whatever, okay? Finally, okay, we will talk about briefly about uh, presynaptic regulation. Okay, pre uh, important presynaptic feedback control mechanisms exist at most nerve terminals. Okay, for example, alpha 2 receptors in the sympathetic nervous system, they are located on the noradrenergic nerve terminals, is activated by nor noradrenaline or norepinephrine, okay, preventing further release of noradrenaline from the nerve end. As you see below here, the uh, the, the neurotransmitter, okay, after its release from the nerve terminal, it can go, go ahead and uh, uh, go back and bind to the presynaptic uh, receptors like alpha-2 and prevent further release. This is kind of a regulatory mechanism, again, to prevent excessive activation of the receptor or excessive function, okay? 
Pre synaptic receptor that respond to the primary transmitter released by the nerve ending is called photoreceptor. So again, pre synaptic receptor that respond to the same transmitter released by the same nerve ending, okay, is called autoreceptor. So the pre synaptic receptor that respond to the same neurotransmitter released from the same nerve terminal, okay, is called autoreceptor. However, if they respond to other or substance released from other nerve terminals, it's called the heteroreceptor. Okay, I hope this is clear, and I will see you in the third uh, introductory part to uh, neuropharmacology. Until then, I wish you the best of the best, and see you later. Bye.